Hi, Liz Child here for Green Earth Organics. Today I'm going to show you how to make kimchi at home. And this is a kind of simplified version of kimchi. It's not really the traditional method, but it works really well. I make it the same kind of way as I make sauerkraut. So in my book, there's a whole chapter on fermenting and there's lots of inspiration on how to make your own kimchi and I go into a lot more depth about it. The ingredients you need can be very flexible but you want some kind of cabbagey vegetable. So in traditional kimchi they normally use those Chinese leaf cabbages which are so beautiful. At the farm at the moment we've got these pak choy so I'm going to make kimchi out of them. You might want to add some extra vegetables as well. So in most kimchis you'll find those beautiful long white daikon radishes and we're using these beautiful little Irish radishes instead and then you can add other vegetables as well like spring onions, carrots, whatever is in season and local um, to use, always the best thing to use. The other thing I'm going to be using today is this beautiful Irish seaweed. Then to me what makes kimchi kimchi is the spicy flavour so I'm going to use fresh chilies, ginger, and garlic to make a spice paste which I'll stir through the chopped and salted vegetables. The other really important ingredient is salt so I'm going to be using again this beautiful Irish sea salt. So first thing you want to do is chop your vegetables and it's quite important to remember to save an outer leaf and I'll show you why we do that at the end. I'm going to save a couple just to be safe. I'm just put them there to one side. The rest of the cabbage I'm just going to cut into bite-sized pieces. I'm just going to trim off that end bit and then just cut it into little bites and pop it in a nice big mixing bowl. And you want to make sure everything you're using is nice and clean. There's no need to sterilise, just a really good clean and a rinse with hot water is fine. Give your vegetables a good rinse as well, get any mud off them. Okay, so you can actually eat the leaves of radishes as well, they're perfectly edible. So I'm going to leave them on and just cut them nice and thin. So when you get dried seaweed like this, it's always a good idea to give it a little rinse. Okay, so I've given it a rinse and I'm just going to chop it up. Okay, so before we make the spice paste, I'm going to get some salt in here so it can start drawing out the liquid from the vegetables and creating a delicious brine. Okay, so you can, if you want to, you can weigh the vegetables, work out what 2% of the weight is and add that amount of salt. Or you can do what I do, which is just wing it. So basically you want it to be pleasantly salty. So just add a bit at a time, give it a taste and um, just stop adding salt when it's pleasantly salty. So for this amount, I would say it's about a, a tablespoon of salt. So you want to just gently tumble the salt through the vegetables. So you want to be a bit gentler with these kind of leaves than you would with a sauerkraut. You don't want to get in there and knead and squish. You want the leaves to keep their beautiful shape and not be too mushy. Before I taste it, I'm just going to let it sit for a while so the salt, because it's flakes, so it just has a time to dissolve and um, I'll give it another mix and taste it in a minute. While I'm letting the salt do its thing, I'm going to make the spice paste. So you need a little food processor and this is totally to taste. So if you like it really, really spicy, then you can use whatever chilies you prefer. These are fairly mild, um, so I'm going to leave the seeds in. You can de-seed them if you like and you can adjust the amount to whatever your taste is. So I'm just going to roughly chop them up and pop them into the food processor. So I normally do a good thumb of ginger for this kind of amount, but if you like it really gingery, do a bit more. And the best way to peel ginger is to use a teaspoon, and this is just to avoid waste. So by using a teaspoon, you can get into all the nooks and crannies and you only take off a very thin layer of the peel. 
ginger skin is actually edible as well so you could just leave the skin on if you prefer. I always cut the ginger before I put it in the food processor. Ginger is quite fibrous so you want to cut against the direction of the fibres so the fibres go uh, lengthways down the root. So just cut across. Even though I'm putting it in quite a strong food processor sometimes the fibres kind of get caught around the blades and just go round and round rather than getting chopped up and nobody likes hairy food. And then you want to add some garlic as well. So for this amount, I'd probably do maybe five or six cloves of garlic. So I find the easiest way to peel garlic is to cut the end off, squish them all under the knife, and then the skins just pop off like so. And if you want, you could add half an onion to this mix as well, or a shallot is really good for flavor. But I'm just gonna keep it really simple today and I'm just gonna blend that up into a nice paste. If you need to add a little splash of water to help things blend, then that's fine, you can definitely do that. So I'm just gonna blend that. Okay, so there's the uh, ginger, chili and garlic paste all blended up. Obviously be careful not to touch this with your hands because it can burn and definitely don't get it in your eyes. Really you should be wearing gloves to do this, but I'm gonna try and be very careful and just use a spoon to deal with the hot stuff. Okay, so back to the bowl of salted vegetables. I'm gonna give it another quick mix and a taste to see if it needs any more salt. So you can probably see it's uh, reduced in volume quite a bit. The salt has already started drawing out the liquid from the vegetables. That's perfect. So like I said, it should just be pleasantly salty and you know, maybe even just slightly on the salty side is fine as well. If you did slip and you put too much salt in, then just add some grated carrot or another cabbage. Next step is just mixing the paste into the vegetables. So I'm just gonna tip it all in and then just carefully using the spoon, mix the paste evenly through the vegetables. And then you will get a nice big clean jar that the uh, mixture will comfortably fit in um, and leave a good bit of headroom and these leaves that you've saved earlier are going to be used as followers so I'll show you how to do that now so as carefully as you can without touching the mixture or use gloves you want to stuff the mixture really firmly into the jar so the best way to do this is just do a little bit at a time and then use a rolling pin to tamp down the vegetables without crushing them too much. But you want to quite firmly just make sure there's no air pockets and just keep going until you've either used up all the vegetables or you've got a good inch or two left of headroom in the jar. And leaving headroom is quite important. Don't panic if your mixture is looking quite dry at this stage. As long as it tastes salty enough, the uh, salt will continue drawing liquid out of the vegetables and creating more brine. So it just needs a bit of extra time. So for the last bit, you want to pack it down as neatly as you can, making a nice flat surface area. And the ideal situation is that the brine rises well above the vegetables. So everything that's submerged in the brine will be perfectly safe. Okay, so this is the stage we're at. You can see, unless I'm pushing down on vegetables, the brine is there. So there's lots of vegetables here poking up above the brine and those would definitely go mouldy if I left it like this. So that's when these followers come in handy. So you wanna use them like a little blanket, I guess is the best term. So just carefully work them into the jar. This is the bit where you really do need to use your hands, so ideally you want to be wearing some gloves. If you've got a fairly firm leaf, then you can just use one, but I'm just layering up a couple here because these are quite delicate. So instead of using my fingers to tuck everything in nicely, I'm just going to carefully use the spoon. So what you're trying to do is get all the little chopped bits that could float up to the surface to stay nice and tightly underneath the brine. So if you use the spoon to tuck everything down, 
if you can work the edges to cover around um, down the edges of the jar the edges of the leaf down the edges of the jar like that then even better but don't panic too much so at the moment it still looks fairly dry but i'm very confident that the salt is still doing its work on the vegetables underneath so you can see here's a nice neatly covered kimchi and all the little chopped bits are nice and safely under the brine but now the problem will be that as it ferments, gases that form during fermentation will cause everything to kind of come up to the surface and will create little air bubbles inside. So to stop that from happening, you want to put a weight on top of the follower. So this has to be something that won't react with the salt. So nothing metal, you wouldn't want to put anything wooden in there because that will absorb the brine. So something glass is ideal or you can buy special uh, fermentation weights. If you don't have anything you could use as a weight, you could use a Ziploc bag. So open it out inside the jar and spread it so that it covers the surface area and then fill it with water and do the zip up and that will act as a weight and a follower. Um, but of course that's single use plastics. But actually the thing I use the most is an old jam jar that fits inside or a small glass. So whatever you can find that fits neatly in, that will hold all the vegetables down nice and snugly. So this is the perfect size actually, because as I put the lid on, it pushes it down. You can see the brine's already rising up. So the brine is up above the vegetables and you can see the follower there. So everything's perfectly safe. And I've taken the little rubber seal off this jar so that it can breathe so I don't need to burp it every day. If you don't have a clip top jar like that that's fine all you have to do is every morning and every evening for the first four or five days at least just gently open and close the jar to allow the gases to escape and that's as simple as that just leave it at room temperature to ferment for a week or longer Give it a taste after a week see if you like it if it's fermented enough for you it should taste really tangy and delicious and kind of pickly and i highly recommend you put it inside a bowl or a tray um, to catch any overspill you'll be amazed at how bubbly the ferment gets as it gets going and things can very easily spurt out and go over if you are burping your jars I would definitely do it over the sink just to be safe and I will show you how it looks in a week okay so it's one week later and my kimchi is looking good so we'll just check on it now so all you need to do is remove the weight and then have a look under the follower give it a taste you can see it's still quite active all those bubbles coming up amazing so I'm just going to give it a little try see if it's done to my liking that is fantastic it's so tangy and spicy and salty and absolutely delicious so then I'm just going to find the uh, rubber seal and close the jar and pop it in the fridge and it should last for ages months and months um, that's if we don't eat it all in that time but yeah, just keep an eye on it. It's a good idea as you go down the jar to transfer it into a smaller jar so that there's less exposure to air and less chance of it um, catching some mold or anything like that. But yeah, it should be absolutely fine for at least a month, if not six or more in the fridge. And how do you eat kimchi? So we eat it all the time with things like rice and noodles. So it goes really well in a cheese toasty. I always put out some jars of ferments on the table with pretty much every meal. Um, you'll be amazed at how many things it goes with. So I hope you give it a go. Let me know if you do. Enjoy!